Yeah. Not yet. How are y'all? No, I'm doing my bike. Oh, I don't think so. Thank you. all the different butters and things. There's a there in this, man. That's what you doing, Good. Yeah, I went to the graveside, sir. I didn't make it over there in time. I was going to go to the other one, but I was out with my friend in the tree and trying to get it to the other Dark pants, I got some more. I got another time I got some. Yeah, that's a good one. Good old West. Okay, good. So I started to come down the stairs. I went and got showered at the cemetery. You guys are headed out for lunch. Thursday. All right, now I want to know. Someone sitting here. Good morning. Good morning. I did see Jess, though. You never know how many. You did? Yeah, I can put her on down there. There you go, Mike. Yeah, he was in there. He was in there. He was in there. Whatever she does. You did look like Scotty was a big stuff in here. Yeah, it's good. Right, it is good. There's Connie. How are you, Connie? I'm good. All right. We've been sitting here a few weeks. I know. It's somebody else's turn. What the hell? Well, let's get started. I, uh, been quite a week. I know lots of lots going on, so... Uh, you know, yesterday, you couldn't turn on the TV without September 11th uh, remembrances, and that's appropriate. That's nothing wrong with that. The, uh, the devotional book I, I use in the mornings, Billy Graham's, uh, on September 11th, he talks about that a little bit. And so I, wanted, I thought that would be appropriate, timely. But I remember when he came to Oklahoma City in 1995, and uh, they asked uh, they asked him one of the questions, you know, why why do things like this happen with the Morris building bombing? And so he kind of reiterates that uh, that response in this particular devotional, but it's targeted to September the 11th. Psalms 46, 1 and 2 says, God is our refuge and strength and our ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. The horror that took place on September the 11th, 2001, will remain stamped in our memories for generations to come. Who could ever forget the sight of those hijacked airplanes slamming into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center? and the side of the Pentagon. Who could forget the courageous men and women who stopped another plane from reaching its destination? And hundreds of brave emergency personnel who lost their lives in the line of duty. I've asked myself hundreds of times why God allows uh, evil to flourish, and I don't have a full answer. And that was exactly what he said in uh, 1995, in his remarks to uh, to the survivors and the families then. You know, why, why does God allow this to happen? And, and he just very publicly said, I don't have the answer to that. And if you ever want to see his full response, you can get it on, I think it's YouTube has it. You can get out there and find that service that they had in 1985. But he says I've uh, uh, he says, I've, I've asked myself hundreds of times why God sometimes allows evil to flourish, and I don't have the full answer. But he does say this, evil is real, and we ignore it at our peril. Evil is so real, it costs God's son his life. But I do know this, even in life's darkest hours, 
God is our refuge and our strength. Not money, not military might, not diplomacy, not human cleverness, but God. As you reflect on what happened on that September the 11th, uh, is our God your refuge and your strength? He can be as you open your heart, uh, as you open your heart and life to Jesus. I uh, thought that might be just a comforting thought for you today as we kind of look, have used this time to reflect on those kinds of things. And we all know that. We've all lived through it. Everybody in this room has lived through events like the Murrah bombing, the events like September the 11th, be it Pearl Harbor, be it whatever. You stop and think if we get as old as, as, as some of us in here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah i got to be careful. Now, I'm than, I mean, I'm older than he is. What are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't ask for true confession. I <laughs> She don't. She don't remember September 11th. So. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, how do I take that? that, that you're too Sorry. young. You're too young. Oh, I see. There you go. I'm, we're going to get on to something else. We're <laughs> <laughs> already in deep trouble, right? 17th chapter, John. We spent two weeks on the first six verses. But I'm going to try to uh, try to get us through the sixth through the nineteenth today. Uh, and I got to tell you, I can't remember. Maybe it was Wanda. She always asks these really penetrating questions that seem to trip me up for days and days and months and years on end. That that the seventeenth chapter was it? What is this your favorite? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I got it right. I got it right. There's reason for us to pay close attention to this chapter. Uh, it's the only place it's recorded in the Gospels, we've talked about this, where Jesus gives this prayer. It's the longest recorded prayer in the Scripture. And John's the only one that's got it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke reveal the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. But it's not this prayer. And for us as Christians and believers, this is a substantial prayer. There are a lot of doctrinal issues covered here. There's a lot of things that Christ reveals about himself, his mission, his work, and his relationship to his Father uh, that we need to come to an understanding about. So... It covers a lot of important things. But it's for the believers. It's not a chapter that is evangelistic. Now, people can read it, and certainly people can, can the word can bring them to a, to a saving grace. I'm not about to deny that. But, but it's really for the believers. For assurance. And for an understanding of what God does for us in keeping us. But the, but the thing is, the, the, the chapter is divided into three sections. We covered the first section last week where Jesus prays for himself. And we're not going to review that. We're going to get right into what the next <laughs> section is about. Starting with the sixth verse through the 19th. This is going to be Jesus pray for Talk about disciples. We typically use disciples as an, as that overview word for all of us. If you're a believer, you're a disciple. Here, this specifically, he's talking about the 11 apostles. And I'm going to try to, as much as I can, use that word apostle as opposed to disciple, and I will not. Always remember to do that, so just bear with me. But just know that when he uses disciples in these verses, 6 through 19, he's talking about the 11 that are with him right there. As a matter of fact, he's praying to God in their presence. And one of the things we're going to look at today is he wants them to hear what he's asking God 
his father to do for them specifically. They need to hear this. They need to understand what he, Jesus, is doing for them. And, and you only see this in the book of John. So let's look at these, uh, at these, these verses. And, and I gotta tell you, if you'll notice up here, I, I divided it, it's, it's concurrent. John 17, 6 through 10, and 11 through 9. In all of the commentaries I typically use, J. Vernon McGee treats those verses right there in about three pages. Okay? John MacArthur treats those verses right there in about 30 pages. And the others somewhere in between. And not that that's any, not one's any less important than the other or more important than the other. It's just that there is so much in there, you can take it as deep as you want to take it. And we're not going to take it MacArthur deep. Okay? I got lost. Okay, it was so deep that we could just sit here and say, oh my goodness. But I don't want to go that deep. But there's a lot of value in that. So we're going to hit, we're going to hit the high points. Sixth, uh, sixth verse as we begin, as we begin there, right off the bat, we need to understand something. I've been accused of a lot of things a lot of times for a lot of reasons, and they're probably all so until the preacher's wife came in, and I'm not going to admit to anything. <laughs> oh my goodness, she's sitting down. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. We don't have eye contact or so. All right. <laughs> we have to understand that there is a doctrine of God's sovereignty. Election. We have to understand that there is a doctrine of free will. And both of those doctrines are there. I like what J. Vernon McGee has to say. He wrote a little snippet. It says, when I was young and just graduated from seminary, I thought I knew everything and I had an answer that I could explain the doctrine of sovereign, uh, the doctrine of, of God's sovereignty, election versus the doctrine of free will. He said, I'm older now, I'm much wiser now, and I've come to my senses. I didn't have a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> and so I just have to accept that it's God's word will go on from there, that it's a mystery to him. And so anybody, in my opinion, anybody that, that wants to say it's one or the other, and the other doesn't count, had better read this chapter. <laughs> and they better read these verses. So that, that you want to keep that in mind, that, that those two doctrinal issues are in these words. They're in this recorded prayer. And they're going to start off real quick. So keep, keep that kind of thing in mind. Uh, and maybe we even might even throw out a couple of things in here about Judas before this is over with. Uh, about who he is and how that plays into election and free will and stuff like that. So, in the sixth verse, I manifested thy name to the men whom I, thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and I have kept and they have kept thy word. Now I'm going to read the 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th verses to go along with that because those, those verses all kind of go together here. Now they have come to know that everything thou hast given me is from thee. For the words which I gavest, thou gavest me I have given them, and they received them and truly understood that I came forth from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom thou givest me, given me, for they are thine, and all things that are mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Yeah. 
Now, on the surface, you look at that, and you're just trying to read it, so I don't understand it. But it's like, what's he talking about? <laughs> well, he's talking about, as he prays to, to the Father, he's talking about what God gave to him as a mission, and what he gave to him to use in that mission, that it was predestined, we've already talked about God, the plan of God, John introduces it when he says the word was with God, God was the word, all that from the very of John 1-1, one, one. Christ was with God from the beginning, and so he's what Jesus is praying here is, is setting the stage for everything that you had you gave to me as a mission. I have given to me. You glorified me through what you had given me. That was foretold. I took what you gave me and entrusted to me, and I have given your word to them, and they have believed that you sent me. What's John's purpose in writing this? To prove the deity of Christ. So we're to prove that Jesus is God, okay, and and that he has given, he has been given things from the Father to perform his mission, and that mission is now over with, although the cross and the resurrection and the ascension haven't taken place, his earthly ministry this is a transition verse. His earthly ministry is over. He's not going to be doing any feeding of the 5,000. He's not going to be uh, bringing a Lazarus forth. He's not going to be healing a sick anymore. None of the signs that the Jews wanted to prove he was the Messiah, those things are over. What's, what's to come is already foreordained for him. He's preparing to ascend back to his rightful place on the throne. So his mission in coming has been completed, and these that God has given him have been prepared. Now, does that mean they fully understand the cross? No. Does that mean that they were fully ready to be sent out? No. <coughs> I want you to think about and the things we'll look at in these next few chapters about these 11 apostles <coughs> and the frailties and their uh, failures, stumblings that they have and we see from a doubting Thomas to a, to a denying Peter after Pentecost, that doesn't happen. After Pentecost, you do not see those frailties. After Pentecost, you see boldness and power. Because the power was provided, but the proof of what they were and who they were, the knowledge that they can profess and testify about, has been given to them through Jesus, and they are then prepared after Pentecost to go and continue the mission Jesus came to start. So while they're still frail, these 11 are still frail at this point, in 50 days, they are not. And that changes with the presence of the Spirit. So we can stop right there and say, let's apply that. Do we believe we receive the Holy Spirit in its fullness when we accept Christ as our Savior? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yes. 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 yes? Yeah, okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> Everybody awake? We got it? All right. <laughs> well, then, we have been empowered to take what we have believed in, what we now profess to believe in, 
and we have a boldness to continue the mission they did in, in their likeness, in their manner. What did they do? They went out. They proclaimed. They taught. They resided with. They, they made disciples. They, they, they took the message that they had been three years preparing for and took it out. But they did it with the power of the Holy Spirit and couldn't. They really couldn't do it. Jesus is going to talk to them about why they couldn't do it until the Holy Spirit came. So looking at this, when he says, I manifested thy name to, uh, to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. First of all, I manifested. What does it mean to manifest? <clears throat> yeah, I I know? You became, became real. You became, became a physical body. Okay. I, I manifested. I revealed to you the truth. I revealed to you the reality of it. I, I, I made it visible to you. I manifested what? Thy name. Jesus is praying to his Father. He manifested, made real to what? The name of Jesus. What's the name? And that's one. Messiah. Hmm? Messiah. Messiah. Okay. Right. What does Isaiah say? Some of you are going to read it in your daily Bible reading. Huh? Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Counselor. Mighty God. Mighty God. I reveal to you his name. Now, if I ask everybody, oh, I'm going to use Chuck. I'm going to pick on Chuck. You're going to pick on me all the time. I want to go. <laughs> if I gave everybody here a piece of paper and says, I want you to write. Without showing it to anybody else, you'll be totally destroyed. Jim, me, I'll use you. And write down what characteristics and you see in me. And don't laugh. I'm not supposed, <laughs> supposed to cuss in church. No, that's true. Now, this is going to get degraded real quick. All right. You would have, you would write down things that would be characteristics, right? Okay. Well, that's what he is. I manifested God, Father, your name to them. I revealed it. And what did he reveal? He revealed the characteristics of God. How did he do that? Because he lived the life of God here, sinless. They saw visible proof of the character of God in Jesus. So in praying to Christ in this, he's saying, I manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Now, right there, if you underline that statement right there, what he's basically saying is somewhere in the eons of past history, God, you <laughs> selected 11. They were out of this world. This is election. You selected 11 and gave them to me. Now, they were fishermen. They were carpenters. They were whatever. They were tax collectors. But they all responded, these 11, all responded to one simple command. What was it? Come follow me. Come follow me. When the command was given, they came and followed. Now they questioned, they watched, they learned, they uh, <clears throat> pushed the envelope boundaries up. But all of that was a teachable thing. But these 11, God selected out. What do we know about them? A lot. But we know that they didn't come to Jesus and say, I'm here for you now, let's go. No. They came seeking. They came observing. They came wanting to know Jesus invites, and they respond. And we know that about them. So God has selected them 
for Jesus from out of this world. They were lost or unprepared. Unprepared. Jesus selected them. And he said, you gave them to me out of the world. Thine they were. Jesus saying to his father, they were yours. It's hard to wrap your head around. They were yours. And thou gavest them to me. What did Jesus say earlier? Something about those that you give to me, I will not. Doesn't that kind of apply here? Thou gavest to me, and they have kept thy word. Now that, that phrase right there, they have kept thy word, is, is a phrase that's going to come back and back and back. They have kept the word. They have secured the word. They have embraced the word. They have, they have just enveloped the word to be obedient to it. Now, the full power of that is not evident yet. The full power of, of obedience to the Word doesn't really come to them until they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, what did he tell them? I'm going to leave you. But I'm going to bring one or let one come or have one will follow that is more powerful than I. And so they're going to be empowered by the presence of the Holy Spirit. But they belong to God in the beginning. He gave them to Jesus. Jesus taught them, revealed the character of God to them in three years of ministry. Okay? And they kept the word. They stayed true to the word. They believed. Now they come to know that everything thou hast given me is from thee. That's the key part of that. It's not just the knowledge. It's the believing in the knowledge and the applying the knowledge to their lives. That everything thou hast given me is from thee. Everything Jesus has has come from God. Once again, John's proving in his argument, in his prayer, that he is in unity, oneness with God. I'm going to go on to say that again here. Everything, everything that, that uh, they have come to know, that everything thou hast given me is from thee. God is the author. God is the source. Jesus is the reflection of that source to them. And they believe that. Sometimes we, we like to separate Jesus. Sometimes we like to think, well, Jesus, well, he, I'm sure glad he came. I'm sure glad he sacrificed and shed his blood for us and, and all of that. But we sometimes mentally want to make him something less than God. We need to be careful about that. And not let ourselves be deceived or entrapped in that. Jesus is in one with God. He is in unity with God. He is God made man. And so when we reflect on Jesus, we need to understand we're reflecting on God. <clears throat> the character, the nature of God is, is proven in the life and display of life that Jesus presented. And so his prayer calls that. Now he's praying this in front of them. He's praying with them listening. They're moving toward Gethsemane. The first part of the 18th chapter says they cross the Kedron Valley and move into the garden. Billy, we were talking about the garden the other day. They move into the garden. I have to be careful because that camera over there picks up certain candy 
things. And also what you're having to, it tells, hand signals tell that camera what to do. So uh, anyway, so uh, I'm going to be careful about that. For the words which thou gavest me in eight verse, I have given them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from thee, and they believed that thou didst send me. They have come to understand. I don't think they fully realize the scope of what that means in terms. They have not. They have not witnessed the cross yet. They have witnessed the the death, burial, and resurrection, and they have witnessed the ascension yet. But those events culminate God bringing Christ back to Him and, and His Christ return to His rightful place, the throne. But, but they now understand what that means, that he is who he says he is. And the words that thou gavest me, I, I've given to them. Now, I ask on this ninth verse, I have no idea where we are on the chart. And I'm going to pass that. Okay, we're over. Aaron, you'll note that I don't keep up with my charts. They're just. I ask on their behalf, I, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. Listen, I do not ask on behalf of the world. You want to talk about personal prayer? This prayer is about those 11. Now, does Jesus ever pray for the world? Somebody give me a classic example that's fixing to come up. Classic example of Jesus praying for the world. On the cross. Forgive them, for they know not what. Who is it to? Them. The world. This evil world. Jesus prays for the world. Here he's praying for these eleven. See, whenever I read that, I don't really get that. I get that he's praying. Yes, he's praying for them, but he's praying for all of his. Now, that includes them and Matthias and, uh, and you know, the others that are there because it's not just the 11 are walking to get Gethsemane with him. It's the, a group, probably. Um, you know, although that's, you mainly hear about the, the 11 or the 12 whenever Judas was around. But, uh, but also he's talking about us. You know, because I think whenever he's praying here, he's not just praying for them. He's praying for everybody that comes to know that follows him. I think here he is praying for them, but he's going to pray for all believers. Verse 20. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the thing, Ellen, here, 20. You have to, I, 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 want you, I want you to see. Next week. Yeah, next week. <laughs> he gets to us, the last part of this prayer. Now, and, and, and a, whole lot of, a whole lot of the last part of the prayer and this part of the prayer applies to both. It does. But here he's talking about these specific 11. That's Jim's take. You don't agree with it? No, I mean, you know, that's, that's everybody's that's okay. opinion, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But is it this kind of like laying on of the hands for, that we would do in the church? For, sure. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a public in the sense that he's talking with them hearing. It's public, but it's very, it's very specific in that he's addressing these eleven. What do we do when we lay on hands? Pray for this one out of the church or two. We come down and we just specifically pray for them. Identify that, and we 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 make that. You don't do like the Pharisees did and go up in front of the church and say. Oh, hey, brother, I be coming in. It's not me. It's not going to be me. No. Come and pray for For a specific task, usually, when we lay on hands, either for an ordination or for a mission trip or something. It's a very specific thing. And Jesus is being, is really, he's being very specific here because he's going to get to this point He's going to get to this point. When he talks about he's given them the word, what's he given? 
truth. He calls it one and the same. Uh, I'm probably going to jump ahead of myself here. Let me get down here to it. Well, I don't want to get in the 17. In, in 17, he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. Now, a lot of people in our world today will say, Well, the Bible contains truth. And it, that's that's short, an bad. accurate statement, but it's not completely accurate. Sure the, full, the full statement is the Bible is truth. God's word is truth. And we as Baptists like to, like to profess the word. People of the word. If we're going to profess that, then we're going to be people of the truth. God's word can't be partly true or mostly true. God cannot tell a lie. He cannot deceive. His word reveals truth. And we stand on truth. So they have been taught through Christ's revelation truth. We want to get away from that. So I, 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 I'll respectfully disagree with that. In that sense, <laughs> okay, in that sense, that he's, he's picked out these 11 here, in my opinion, and go to verse 20, he's going to, next week, he's going to talk to us. What about, the, okay, then they, later on, they have the, another apostle, because they had a group of people, because they wanted to add back to the original 12, and they had a group of people that had to make, meet all these uh, criteria, and because they were with him from the beginning and, and, and through his ministry, et cetera, et cetera, would those people have been included in, in this prayer? Because they do replace, I mean, 20. Because they do replace one of the, you know, replace you. Start in 20. Okay, so you know. Okay. Well, Matthew Henry will disagree with you. I'm sure. <laughs> because I read, I read a little bit of it on what he had to say about it, too. So well, and, and, I, and I don't just, I, I know. I know. I'm going to fight that. Like I said. How deep do you want to go? You want to, how deep do you want to go? Because if you get with MacArthur, you'll take it down a path that'll take you really, really deep. Henry will take you deep. J. Burn McGee will say, it's a mystery. <laughs> and that the 11th thing. verse said, that uh, he, for the Heavenly Father to keep his name and uh, these whom thou hast given me that they may be one as we are. So he's referring to himself and God's relationship and he is close to God and those 11 are the only ones that we know were close to God doing his will. So the, that, the prayer is for God to keep them. Right. And 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 they're not of this world. But speaking, I'm sorry, I'm in very little sense, but speaking of election, because you use the word. Yeah. Um, isn't it more like with Mary? She was chosen because she was already God. She was already following God, and so he selected her. I mean, he knew what she was going to do before the foundation of the world. Yes, but I think she had a choice to follow God. And then because she was a follower of God, she was able to be yeah. true, you know. And, and that's true, true though, of all of the Old Testament prophets, too, that he chose. Yeah, they, they, they were chosen. They were already following God, and yeah. then they became followers of Christ. When they so I, I, let's don't, I, I don't want you to say that. These eleven suddenly became the magnificent eleven. <laughs> <laughs> they're, 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 they were among a number. Abraham was chosen by God in a lost world, and and so you have you have prophets of the Old Testament. You have Mary that was chosen of God. For a bucket. 
These 11 were chosen of God for a function. What was that function? To follow the ministry of Christ and learn from it that it becomes the model of how God's word was to be expanded in the, in the lost and dying world. And their mission was to do what Jesus came to do, to evangelize in three and a half years, prove he was Christ, and prove belief in him brings salvation through him bring salvation, and they were to go out and build the church, that body of believers. Am I getting close? Is that okay? Questions? Can I just... Um... Sure. <laughs> That's why we're in this kind of a setting. Oh, weird. Okay. So, God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had a destiny, and this was His destiny. Okay, the disciples had a destiny, and he led them to be able to complete that destiny. I, I believe he gives us all a destiny, and he knew it from way back when. We have a choice. Do we want to follow God's destiny, or do we not? Well, let, let's, let's take this. Take, hold on to that thought. Apply that thought. Uh, look at verse 14. I've given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. Why not? What, what did Christ tell the apostles? The world hated me before it hated you. Mm -hmm. It hates me because it opposes evil. It's going to hate you because you, believing in me, oppose evil. And so, they, they are not of the, even as I am not of the world. Jesus is not of the world. Where is he going? Where did he come from? Came from the throne of God. He's going to the throne of God. <coughs> and we're going to the throne of God because of our belief in him. You see, the thought is, I'm kind of off track here, the thought is, when does eternity become real for us? When does eternity become real for us? When we die. When? When we die. When the day you're born. When we accept Jesus as a Christ. There you go. Okay. Now, we can go back and argue. Because you're still going to live even after you're dead. Well, there's a there's an eternity, eternity of judgment. Eternity and judgment are eternity. So you're still eternity happens the day you're <laughs> or the day you're conceived. I should say. <laughs> when does our eternity with Christ begin? Okay. The day we accept Jesus. All right, the day we accept Jesus. How many of us look at it that way? I dare say most of us didn't really think about. Maybe all fingers point to Jim, and I'm sitting here the only one. And you guys, <laughs> you did it? You missed it all. But I dare say most of us didn't think about eternity as being something that we're going to participate in until we die. No, we're participating in eternity now. We accept Christ as our Savior. We. We are a part of eternity. That assurance of eternity begins at salvation. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit begins with salvation. And once that happens, now, is does it grow? Are we are, is, is the glorification going to going to grow? Yeah. But we are participating in eternity now. We no longer are of this world. Where are we? We're in this world, but our eternity is not of this world now. Ponder on that. It ought to make us have a difference in the way we think and the way we act as Christians. In what we do. We are no longer of this world. We're in this world. Because Jesus came. He, 
He experienced everything that we experience. He was not in this world. He was before this world. And then he was placed in this world. He was in the world, but he wasn't of the world. His eternity is the throne. Does that have an impact on what, how we act? How we deal with one another? Unity? Let's look at the rest of this. I forget the charts. <laughs> just, just forget that. <laughs> Twelfth verse, I was with them, and I was keeping them in thy name, which thou hast given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, and the, that the scripture might be filled. The son of perdition. Who was that? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So the son of perdition. What does perdition mean? Destruction it's, is my it's, what? it's destruction. It's a judgment. It's a judgment of destruction. It's a judgment where it's going to place a judgment in hell. It's a judgment that separates them from God. <clears throat> Ask you a question. Were there 12 apostles at this time? Or were there 11 at the beginning of this evening? Yeah. Because Paul was the 12th. Was Judas saved? He must not have been because Jesus said he kept all those that were given to him. All of those that were given to him. He kept, and he had not lost one. Got your mind thinking? I see a lot of wrinkled foreheads in here. Uh, okay? Hey, yeah. I, I know a guy that claimed to be an apostle, so I look like 13. That's the truth. He does say that. Yeah. There's one more out of time. We'll talk about Paul later. <laughs> but here, Jesus identifies Judas apart from the others. He talks about having kept those that were given to him and none were lost. Judas, it does not say Judas Let me rephrase that. Somebody find me in the passage of scripture that says Judas responded to come follow me. I don't remember it being in there. Consider the possibility Judas was not an apostle to start with. Did Judas have free will? Could he have? Could he have possibly decided not to betray Jesus? Judas has to be held accountable for his decision. Was he not given at the Last Supper the opportunity? Arian's already over there googling something. I'm sorry. When it talks about Judas coming to him, he says he called his apostles to him and chose twelve of them and lists Judas. Who became a traitor. So I would argue he's one of them, like the tares in the wheat. He can't, he didn't surrender everything, obviously. Right. And God knew what he was going to do, and he fulfilled scripture, but. And he was exposed he was to everything Jesus taught. Was he not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he not see the, did he not see the, uh, the, was he not in the boat? Did he not have to be the 5,000? Was he there at the raising of Lazarus? But does that save him? No. 
But to be saved is just to believe who he is. He isn't, he didn't deny him. We're a table divided right here. We're a table divided. <laughs> <laughs> and there's all the Jews. <laughs> but I think, I, I think, I think for, for what we're looking at here, Jesus is saying, those you gave to me that believe, what did he say? He, he led the conditions of it. They believed who I was. The Son of God. They believed in the deity of Christ. <laughs> Judas is not included in that. And what causes us not to have eternal life? Not believing in Jesus as the Son of God. Not accepting Jesus as uh, as your Lord and Savior, because even the devils, even the demons, okay. believe that He is the Son of God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you know that. Right. Yeah. All right. I stand. I stand correct. Right. But the, but that's the accepting. Point. But that's the point. Yeah. It's through Jesus salvation comes, Absolutely. and believing in in Him. Right. And so you you've got a, a real paradox here. That there is a separation between those that I want you to keep and ask for God to keep them and not take them. They're not of this world. Don't take them. And Jesus didn't ask for him, them to be taken out of this world. He asked for them to be preserved, protected, protected from the evil. Now, were they protected from floggings, death? Arrests. No, no, no. no, they were not. They were not. But that's not the evil. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 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 You get bloody, didn't you? I hear a voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I can see right now we've, there's a reason why this has. Was a long lesson and divided divided up. But let's let's finish this up. I think I've given you something to think about. Sixteenth uh, verse: They are not of the world, even as I, I am not of the world. Sanctify them. Sanctify means to set apart. We talk about it lots of times as being set apart to be holy, and we identify sanctify with holy. But the word actually does not mean sanctify, and and that makes them holy. But it says, set apart, uh, set them, sanctify them in the truth. Set, set them apart in the truth. What's the truth? It's God's word. Thy word is truth. Now that's Jesus talking about, and he didn't say maybe, sometimes, partially, or, or every other word. Thy word. The word of God is truth. As thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now there comes, the reason why this is a transition into the mission of Jesus, Jesus came into the world to do his mission, to do the task of God. That mission is now complete with the exception of the final acts of which the, these 11 are not going to participate in. The, the cross, crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. These 11 are not going to participate in that yet. They're going to see this. This is the final, this is the end result of, of Jesus' mission. But what does it say? Jesus says, you sent me, and that mission is complete, and I send them. Now, Ellen, this is where that next, that leads into this next passage part of this prayer is take those that take those that they lead to you and keep them too and treat them like the apostles. And we'll get into that next week. So it said sanctify them in truth, the word is truth as thou didst send me into the world I also have sent them into the world and for their sakes wrapping this up I sanctify myself I set myself apart 
that they themselves may also be set apart in truth. Well, we get all tied up in the words. But Jesus is really saying, treat them like I treat them. Treat them like you treated me. Set them apart like you set me apart. There's a mission to accomplish. And, and that's going to carry over into you and I. But when we often think about, we have Old Testament, here comes to God, the trial lines, he calls people, he captains of people, and he puts them in the land, and he puts out there and milk and honey, and they go out and they my rebel, and he, here, he no. chastises them, and he promises them a sign, and away you go into my sign, and come back. And here we are at, what is year zero. zero. <laughs> so, okay. When we come to year zero, here's Jesus. He's born. He has a mission, and that's to bring. The word to life. The truth of God to life. That has been done. But not to everybody. Jesus takes these 11, empowers them, presence of the Holy Spirit, and they are to go out now on their mission. And guess what? They live, they die, they move on, and that mission falls to you and I. And we're to keep doing that, replicating that mission until he comes again and calls his own, until he calls the church. But this prayer, this prayer, he starts about himself. He prays for the eleven, and then he prays for all that will follow. And it puts you and I in that position of having the assurance of eternity. He talks about, where's where does he talk about joy? <laughs> it's in there, uh, it's in there in someplace in there and I left it. Oh yeah, 13. I speak in the world that they may have my joy. My joy. Earlier, he talked about his life. He talked about what he, he had and they would have it. Now he's talking about his joy, and he prays that they will have it, have access to it. Guess what? It's going to boil over you and I. That we may have the joy of Christ in its fullest. And that comes through obedience to his word, acknowledgement of who he is and what he is, and serving him. And we will have the joy of Christ in its fullest. Peace, that's another word he's got. Life, joy, and peace. Those three things Jesus has asked for these eleven. He also asked for us. All right, we're going to shut it down and have a prayer. If you got more questions, comments, disperse more than I had. Huh? More than I had when we started. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Bobby will teach next week. <laughs> he'll, he'll go research all that. All right. We'll see. Area, now you're in the now you're in trouble. <laughs> That's good. You'll have to come back next week and defend yourself. <laughs> you, would you want to teach next week? I think they prefer you. Uh, <laughs> all right. It's really deep. There's a lot there. We just hit the top of the waves. So, so spend time in God's work. Spend time in God's work. And I encourage you to participate in, uh, in the Read Through the Bible exercise. In a year, I mean, there's there's things I haven't read in an awful long time that have cropped up. So, whoosh, wish I'd have remembered that one. Or, wow, I didn't know about that. So, I think it's good for us. The more time we spend in God's Word, the more time we spend in the truth. The more time we spend in the truth, the clearer we are about what our mission is. Hey, yeah. 
what that God do to those lions to keep them from jumping to Abraham and Daniel when they told him in the pit with the lion? I think he took away their hunger, Gene. And they closed their mouths when they couldn't yeah. help them. I don't know. They don't specifically say <laughs> I don't think it did. It's a God thing, in that sense. He, he, mm -hmm. Something only he could do. Yeah. One of those mysteries. And, and you know what? Billy, he saved me, and that's only something God can do. Yeah, that's true. You know, it's just that way. Let's have work prayer. We have families that are grieving. We have folks that are healing. We just have a lot going on. Father, we just come before you, Lord, so grateful for the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, we take these passages of scripture and we just uh, we just read them. Uh, help us, Father, to open our hearts and open our minds to let the truth of your word just uh, reside in us. Help us to feed upon it and grow with it. To become obedient to your word, Lord, that we might be and do what you would have us to be and what you would have us to do. That a lost and dying world would see light, your light, in our lives and in the life of this church. Be with the pastor as he brings the message this morning, Lord. Just give him the words to say. We want to praise you. We want to honor you. We want to love you. It's in Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, I uh, saw Ron. Oh.